who destroyed Alexander's greatness. Johann Gustav Droysen, creator of Greece's fake history. Perhaps it was convenient that German created Greece's history. Only the Germans at the time understood how powerful history was, especially if you twist it, invent it and fake it. People hear, Hellenistic this, Hellenistic that all the time, envisioning in their minds something very old, ancient if you will. If you envision something old, you'd be right, because it goes back to 1833. If you envision something ancient, sorry to disappoint you. What happened in 1833? Greece had just gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire. To be more precise it was given to her by France and Britain. In return, Greece received a French-appointed German ruler, Prince Otto. Otto was a freshly arrived hit in Greece. He loved the ethnic soup there, though he grew a bit concerned as to how he would rule this people. His biggest concern was Athens, where the Albanians and Turkish dominated. Prince Otto contacted his 27-year-old friend Johann Gustav Droysen at Friedrich Wilhelm University. The student-turned-part-time teacher was such an authority on his subject history that he was a private dozen and then a professor appointed by Otto without a salary. Even Prince Otto didn't think he was good enough to have a salary. Granted, friendship can sometimes go far, as in this case. Johann was hired by Greece's ruler to create the new history for Greece, to unite the populace, give him an idea of a language in such a way that the populations wouldn't be in a conflict. Johann Gustav had recommended Albanian as the core language of Greece because it dominated Athens. This idea didn't go well with Prince Otto who explained that people in and outside of Athens spoke Turkish as well. Besides, the idea was to unite the populations. Johannes showed his cleverness by suggesting to adopt the long-lost coin language. Imagine Americans today adopting what is now considered the dying Latin language. Prince Otto loved Johannes' idea and it was set in stone. Coin was the language. Better yet, the language was called Greek, the German-born Greek ruler decided. Little it was known that Otto's friend and history professor Johann Gustav had transferred to yet another university, this time at Kiel, where once again was not able to get a salary. Shortly afterwards he made a decision to move into politics. You'd think history would have worked out for him. We are not done with Greece and Johann Gustav Droysen. Once the coin language was introduced, Johann decided to further help Prince Otto in uniting the ethnic soup in Greece. Hellenism. This word was coined by none other, but our remarkable history professor turned politician Johann Gustav in 1836. I understand few of you are disappointed because this term doesn't go back in ancient time as some believe. 1836 is the year, the word Hellenism was first coined. Not a minute before that. When you consider who created the word, any comment can be superfluous. By all means, Johann did his job, he was tasked to unite, not to divide. Yes, he went perhaps a bit too far with the Hellenism phrase, not to mention calling coin Greek. I suggest to Macedonians to adopt the Hebrew language and call it Macedonian, that way anything they find written in Hebrew can claim as being Macedonian. Easy enough, if you follow Greek logic. Perhaps, I'd accept the term Hellenistic to describe something that happened in Athens, though I don't know what that would be, still, the term Macedonistic period should, and ought to be, used to cover any other historical references. 
There is no denying that the period from Alexander the Great until well into the Roman time deals with Macedonian dynasties, their rule, succession and their eventual interaction, or lack thereof with the indigenous local populations throughout the Balkan Peninsula, Asia and Egypt. The term «Hellenistic» can hardly do any justice to historical scholarship since its coverage domain leaves a huge section of history barely touched. Hellenism, the term Johann Gustav Droysen gave to this era, is such a narrow cultural belt of history that its usage is not only misleading and inappropriate but it very much distorts and minimizes the greatness of the ancient Macedonians. Perhaps the Athenian contribution, from a cultural point of view, may be argued to have occupied a place of some importance in the administrative sector of the empire, the organizational, the military and the structural components of the Macedonian empire must have been obtained. Delivered and maintained strictly from Macedonian resources and for Macedonian interests. The concept of an empire, an esoteric notion for the Athenians, was born with the first few initial successes of Alexander, and its meaning, magnitude, scope and structure grew as the string of victories and the success on the battlefields allowed Alexander to enlarge, coordinate and control huge land areas in Asia and Egypt. Was Alexander the Great really of Albanian, Illyrian origin? Sir William Woodfork Tan, of the British Academy, regarded worldwide as having written the definitive work on Alexander the Great, states in the opening paragraph of his book Alexander the Great that Alexander certainly had from his father Philip II and probably from his mother Olympia Illyrian. Albanian, blood. During Rose Wilder Lane's visit to Albania in 1921 resulting in the publication in 1923 of her book Peaks of Shala, she heard the following rather extraordinary rendition of Albanian oral history about Alexander the Great from an Albanian elder. There was at that time two capitals of the United Kingdom of Macedonia. There was Pella, between Salonika and Manastir, and there was Emathia, the old capital, lying in the valley which is now Matia High, fertile plateau north of Tirana, near the coast of northern Albania Ed. Alexander's father, Philip II had great houses in both Pella and Emathia, and before Laika I Mathi was born, his mother left Pella and came back to the original capital, Emathia. It was there that Laker I. Mathi was born, and there he lived until he was out of the cradle and rode on a horse when he first went down into Pella to see his father who came from the city to meet and see his son for the first time. Philip II was very proud of his son, and his pride led him to the one great foolishness of a good and wise king. He said that he would make Laker I. Mathi king of the world, and that was well enough, but he thought to be king of the world a man must be more learned than he himself. Whereas all old men who have watched the ways of the world know that to be strong and ruthless will make a man powerful, but to be learned makes a man full of dreams and hesitations. In his pride and blindness, Philip II sent to Greece for an Albanian who had learned the ways of the Greeks, and to that man he gave the boy, to be taught books. The Albanian's name was Aristotle, and he came from a family of the tribe of Ageropi, his father having gone to a village in Macedonia and became a merchant there. Being rich, he sent his son, who was fond of thought rather than of action, to learn the Greek ways of thinking. And it was this man who was brought by Philip II to teach his son, 